All right, so we have a few more seconds until we'll be on live. Great. 20. All right, and informal and conversational. It's gonna be great. great. Yeah, I'm, I usually try not to over prepare for interviews anyway, because I feel like the worst is when it sounds mm -hmm. rehearsed and memorized. So. Yes, oh, that's a good point. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, we've got about five, five seconds. Five, four, My background. three, two, <laughs> Hello everyone on Facebook Live. This is Lindsay James, your state representative coming from Dubuque. And I am happy to have on um, our political, a political reporter and uh, political commentator and very popular political blogger, Laura Bellin with us today. She is here, hello Laura. <laughs> she is here to talk about the politics of COVID-19, um, you know, we're watching how COVID is shaping our state and our country. Um, of course, it's also shaping our politics, but our politics are also, you know, in return shaping how we respond to COVID. And so, um, you know, to help us kind of think through all of the politics at play on a state level and at a national level um, is, is our special guest, uh, Laura Bellin, who is a political commentator. So if you are um, just seeing this live, um, make yourself known in the live comment feed. Say who you are and um, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, post questions that you have. We're going to take some time to answer live questions, um, but you know you can post them throughout the entire conversation. And if it um, and we can get to it, we'll get to as many as we can. So, Laura, before we um, before we jump into questions, I want to um, tell tell people a little bit more about um, who you are. Um, Iowans know you best as the primary author of the popular blog, Bleeding Heartland. Mm -hmm. And I love this. Des Moines uh, City View Civ uh, Civic Skinny said you are probably the hardest working and perhaps the best political reporter in the state and one of the best investigative reporters in the state. Okay, so there's, there's more, there's more, Laura. I know, you know there's more. But for everyone out there, um, the fix that the Washington Post has an opinion about Laura and Bleeding Heartland. Um, the fix says, uh, has named Bleeding Heartland among the best state-based political blogs and even called you, Laura, um, one of the top Iowa political tweeters. I love that that's a cultural category. <laughs> um, Politico, we all know Politico put you um, on its list of early state must follows. Um, and Charles Pierce of Esquire has called Bleeding Heartland an essential Iowa political blog. Now, this is just what people are saying about you. Your list of accomplishments and background is much more extensive. So it is, it, we only have a half an hour though. So um, I didn't say Lindsay to say any of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, she didn't. It is true. But it's a very, it's an honor to have you on and, you know, kind of help us sort through some of the, uh, you know, the politics um, in this really challenging time. So thank you. No, thank you. And, you know, I mean, like, I think a lot of reporters, I mean, I've been thrown into becoming a healthcare reporter. Normally, public health is not a main area of focus for me. And there is so much going on in this election year. And I've had to set aside a lot of the kind of political stories that normally I would be covering, just because it's overwhelming to try to keep up with the coronavirus news. Right, right. And so important. So thank you, yeah, for doing that. Well, I'm, um, you know, it's kind of fun to flip the script here as, you know, someone who's in politics getting to ask a reporter questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, start off with a hard one, not an easy one. <laughs> so um, Laura, you promoted an article on your site with the headline, The Divide That Conquered Us. Can you describe the divide that you're seeing here in Iowa as it relates to COVID-19? And then can you, you know, talk a little bit about the divide you're seeing on a national level? So what is this divide? Sure, I wanna say that was a, a post by my guest author, Ira Lasher, and I'm really proud to publish more than 100 guest authors every year. That's one of, it's important to me that Bleeding Heartland is a community blog and not just uh, my own commentaries. But yes, I think that this, with any major national news story often, it uh, reveals a kind of partisan divide. And I think now what we're seeing is there are a few different kinds of divides. First of all, there's the divide between people who think it's a very serious public health threat and those who think it's just massively exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, a divide between those who think that the government's obligation right now should be doing as much as we can to slow the spread, to try to bring the spread down to almost nothing, versus those who think that 
the main point should be just to for vulnerable people to stay home and for everybody else just to go about their lives. And if you're not in a particularly high risk group for COVID-19, then just keep doing what you're doing. And that seems to be the divide. I would say that's happening in every state. One of the main differences between Iowa and some of the other states where we've seen more protests is because we have a Republican governor, the largely conservative faction who disagrees with the mitigation policies, we haven't seen the kind of mass protests uh, even when Iowa did have stricter um, mitigation efforts in place, we didn't see armed protesters showing up at the state house because I think our governor is a Republican. And, and likewise, the Republican legislators here haven't been as critical of the governor's policies because she's from their own party. I think if we had a Democratic governor right now doing exactly the same policies, there would be a lot more criticism coming from the Republican lawmakers, but they're willing to give Governor Reynolds quite a bit of leeway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we're back in session on June 3rd, so let's hope that no um, armed people come and protest there. So here's yeah, to hope. Stay, stay safe there. I, I'm pretty worried about people coming from every corner of the state to congregate in the state house. So I know it. I know it. We. Um, I feel a little bit of anxiety about that too. And um, we're just learning some of the things that you know the safety protocols that will be put in place for us. And you know, hopefully, we'll get in there, pass a budget, and get out as fast yes. as we can. So I'll be watching uh, from the live stream at home. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. At a safe distance. Good, good, good. Well, um, I want to know from you, um, because you're just all over the place talking to so many people, what are you hearing from Iowa's hospital leaders, the public health experts here in the state, epidemiologists, on how we here in Iowa are handling COVID-19? And does this match the governor's strategy? So how are we handling it based on public health perspectives? And does this match what the governor is doing? Well, I think there's a mix and a lot of, most people don't want to speak publicly. A lot of people in the hospital field um, don't want to speak publicly and a lot of doctors don't want to speak about it. I, there are a few epidemiologists and doctors who have been very outspoken. Dr. Rosanna Rosa of Unity Point in Des Moines and uh, Dr. Um, Eli Perenchevich of the University of Iowa's medical school. He's an epidemiologist. He's been very outspoken on Twitter. Um, Eli Iowa is, is his handle. And uh, they've been, they're very concerned. And I've been hearing privately from some people in the medical field, they would like to see more people staying home, not just the people in vulnerable vulnerable groups, the people over 65 or those with underlying conditions. They would like to see all Iowans continuing to really minimize their contact with people outside the household to slow the spread. And I think there's a lot of skepticism in the public health world on whether we really have turned the corner enough to justify uh, opening up restaurants and other kind of businesses that are opening this weekend. Right, right. Which is, I'm, you know, as questions get raised in the live comments. So if you are here watching live, please do ask questions on the live feed um, and we'd be happy to get after those. But yes, that is a question in a lot of people's minds. You know, just recently, the um, last 22 counties joined the 77 with, um, you know, lifted restrictions. And, you know, is that too soon? And I'm sure we'll, we'll find out. So, um, can you hospitalization numbers have yeah. stabilized a little bit, but yeah. that's a lagging indicator, right? So the people who are getting infections now may not even have symptoms for another week or so. Right. Then they might not be in the hospital for another one to two weeks after that. So what we're seeing in the slightly reduced hospitalization numbers this week isn't related to just things that opened a week ago. It might be related to policies we had in place in April. Right. And I'm right. a little bit concerned, you know, the governor today at her press conference touted the declining number of people in ICUs, but we've also had a high number of deaths this week. And I'm worried about maybe fewer people are in ICUs because a lot of them died, mm -hmm. as opposed to fewer people becoming sick and later needing to be on an ICU. Right, right. Well, and it's the stories are starting to really surface now. I mean, these are our, our grandparents, parents, family members, loved ones, friends who are losing their lives um, in very horrifying ways. I mean, the actual damage that this can do on your body is significant. And then to have to die alone is, um, you know, something that is really you know, a horrifying reality. So we want to keep people as safe as possible. Well, um, thank you for that. Um, can you describe for us, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the strategies, but there's kind of the politics of shelter in place. Um, you talked a little bit about those numbers. Um, you know, can you talk about how the metrics 
you know, play into decisions like shelter in place or opening and reopening? Um, what are those metrics? Are they reliable based on what epidemiologists and public health experts are saying? That's a lot of questions right. to into one, Laura. So, well, I mean, so Governor Reynolds has talked about lots of different kinds of metrics. So first, the yes. Department of Public Health had this 12-point scale, and they were giving all the six regions of Iowa a score. And she said, if we hit a 10 out of 12, then that might trigger a shelter in place. And then, of course, when Northeast Iowa did hit that 10 in the middle of April, she increased some of the restrictions, but she didn't exactly call it a shelter in place. And now they've just abandoned that whole regional approach with the matrix. So then the governor was saying she was looking at the case numbers on a county by county basis. And that was why she decided to open up in 77 counties and not in the other 22. Well, most of those 77 counties have seen case increases since May 1st. And yet the response has been to open up the whole state rather than tighten things up in those 77 counties. And other states are doing different strategies. I mean, the state of New York has very tight restrictions on what benchmarks need to be met before they would even think about lifting their shelter in place order. And it's the same in, in a number of localities in California, Washington state, I was looking at their guidelines. I mean, where Iowa is just nowhere near what would need to happen in Washington state to start lifting some of these restrictions, like in-person dining at restaurants. Wow. So can you tell us just a little bit about like, what are the guidelines in Washington state or how do those vary across state to state? Well, it, I mean, there are a lot of differences, but in some places they're looking at, for instance, a county to have no new cases over a whole week or to have a very clear decline over a two to week, three to week period in new cases. And we're definitely not having that. We're having a lot of counties where we have more cases. And uh, sometimes they're looking at the percentage of positive cases. And the governor has touted that. She said, we're doing more testing now and the percentage of people coming back and testing positive is lower. But that's I, a lot of public health people want to see consistently lower than 10% positive tests before you could start to say that the virus isn't actively spreading in your state or in your community. And we, we just know in Iowa that there's such a big difference between what's happening in the Sioux City area or in Polk County versus some other counties. And so it concerns me that there is a one size fits all model now for what's allowed to be open. Sure, sure, right, right. And we gotta, how do we think critically as things evolve as well? You know, that, yeah. Well, I wanted, I'll be getting takeout from restaurants that are continuing to not be open for in-person dining. I really wanna support the local restaurants, but yeah. I respect, I know some of the restaurant owners are trying to watch very closely and, uh, and not have, um, and not open right away just because they're allowed to be open right away for in-person dining. So I would encourage people to do takeout or delivery food if they wanna eat in a restaurant right now. I would not sit indoors in a restaurant. Right, right. Well, and what other practices, I mean, are you, are you taking? Are you wearing masks when you go out? How does- I, Yes, I've been really minimizing my public outings and I'm an extroverted person. I mean, I like being out with people. So I have, I've not, met up with any friends for any any reason yep. lately really and that's that's hard i understand that that's hard on people i do walk the dog alone i don't wear a mask when i'm going out walking alone but if i, I go about once a week to high vee to buy groceries and i do wear a mask there i also wear i'm ordering a face shield because face shields are actually better than a mask it covers your eyes so i've been wearing sunglasses to cover my eyes as well as a handmade like a cloth face mask but that's that's not ideal situation, but I've been really avoiding unnecessary errands and I haven't been gathering. When the governor says don't gather in groups larger than 10, honestly, the public health researchers are, are saying that it's much safer just to avoid socializing with anyone outside your household. So we're not having a few friends over for dinner. We're not having a few friends over for game night. We are just, I'm communicating with people virtually or by phone and I'm not hanging out with people who are not part of my household right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's good for our viewers who are listening in live. You know, here is Laura who is looking at metrics, you know, across the country and advice and thoughts from public health experts and epidemiologists all across the country. So it's it's good to know what kind of your 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 the approach you're taking. So that's really quite helpful. So is there any what are the politics behind the metrics? And you know, one of our viewers um, asked about, you know, the goalposts. You know, there's mm -hmm particular metrics, and then it seems like the goalpost has been moved. Like, what are the politics behind the metrics? Well, the goalposts have been moved a lot because the governor originally in early April, she talked about how she wouldn't be opening things up in Iowa until things were on a clear downward trend. And that 
has not happened. And she's when she initially talked about flattening the curve, it was going to be a reduced number of infections. And now when she says we've flattened the curve, what she means is we've made sure our hospital resources haven't gotten overwhelmed. And that, that was always, it's a big part of flattening the curve is making sure that you slow the spread enough so that you don't end up like Italy where they had hospital patients in hallways because they didn't have enough beds for them. And that's a disaster that it looks like we've averted for now. And I mean, thank goodness for that. But flattening the curve is also about reducing the total number of infections and the total number of deaths. So really, I think that the goal should be to just slow the spread of the virus as much as possible. And there are countries with greater populations than Iowa that have brought their new infection rates down to almost zero. They are really, they've had much stricter shelter in place orders. They require masks, everyone to wear masks in public at all times. And the Czech Republic and Slovakia are two examples. And they're just starting to gradually reopen things there, but their new infections are minimal, like single digit number of new infections a day. Whereas in Iowa, we have hundreds of new cases a day. Yeah, yeah. And were you able to surface any of the numbers from today, uh, the governor's press conference? And I know she's been changing her messaging a bit. Yes, well, they, we had 18 new deaths reported. And it's, I'm just looking at my spreadsheet here. It was uh, 300. And let's see, we've had this week, the case numbers were a little bit lower, 374 new cases. So yesterday they reported 386. And the governor, this I think is interesting, just this week at her press conferences, she started talking about the doubling time. The doubling time is a, is a measure that a lot of epidemiologists use. So the amount of days it would take to double the current number of cases you have. And she's never talked about that before. So I, I found that interesting, but she says that our days to double have now lengthened to 18. So that we now have a total of just over 14,000 confirmed coronavirus cases. So at the current rate of days to double, we would double that in about 18 days to 28,000 cases. And of course, the then the hospitalizations and the deaths follow on from there. Um, I'm just particularly concerned when we already have 336 deaths. That's a lot. That's basically at the level of average traffic fatalities, vehicle crashes for an entire year in Iowa. It usually fluctuates between about 330 and 340, and we're only two months into this pandemic. So that concerns me, and we don't know whether with restaurants and fitness centers opening up and shopping malls, I hope we don't get a new spike of cases, but it concerns me that four to six weeks from now, we could start seeing a rising death toll from that. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple Facebook Live questions that I want to get to. Um, Joseph from West Des Moines, your neck of the woods. Um, his question is, uh, from your perspective, Laura, has the governor's effort really been saving lives and keeping people safe? Or has this really been about reacting based upon whether hospitals got overwhelmed? Well, I mean, by her own admission, she's been more focused on making sure the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. And she's often mentioned, I mean, she said that it's a tragedy when anyone dies, but she's often emphasized that most of the deaths have been in vulnerable populations and more than half of the deaths have been in nursing homes. I mean, I, I really object to that framing of the issue. Uh, friends of mine, a friend's father, uh, he was over age 90 and he was living in assisted living. He got COVID-19 and died last week. And you know, my friend and his wife were devastated. They weren't able to be with him at any time during his illness. They weren't able to have anyone come to the funeral. And so it's just to say these people were still loved and valued. I mean, you can say, well, oh, well, it's mainly just the vulnerable populations dying. But where does that leave the people who cared about them? And I feel like the focus has been to get the economy back and up and running and not on prioritizing what we need to do to, to keep the total number of infections down and the total number of deaths down. And I, I uh, fear that we are going to end up with a lot of deaths in Iowa that could have been prevented. Yes, yes, yeah which is what we do not want to have happen. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask another, uh, I'll just, Evelyn uh, here from Dubuque talks about, um, she hates it when politicians word, use words that indicate that COVID-19 will just disappear, mm -hmm. when in reality, the infection rate just d diminishes. Um, what responsibility do journalists play in correcting this deliberate deception about risks associated with contracting COVID-19? 
Well, I think it's, it's something that journalists are talking about a lot. I've seen a, a lot of guidance for journalists and people are worried. And I saw some criticism that early on in the pandemic, there was too much focus in the media about how mainly it was older people who were at high risk because we do see people in their 20s or 30s or 40s without underlying conditions. Some of them are getting severely ill or ending up in, in ventilators or, or dying. And there are even children now in New York State is looking at a lot of cases of an unexplained syndrome in children that looks like Kawasaki syndrome that may be related to COVID-19. So I think it, it, journalists really shouldn't be downplaying the risks that otherwise healthy people have from this virus. But I will say, I mean, in defense of Governor Reynolds, she hasn't ever claimed the virus would disappear. She's been saying, we're gonna have to live with this virus. It's gonna be with us until we have a vaccine. And so you're all just gonna have to deal with it. And if you're vulnerable, stay home. And everybody else kind of, you know, go go and do what mostly what you were doing. I mean, she's talking about some social distancing guidelines, but basically she's she's not telling everyone stay home except for essential errands. She's really that message is mainly for vulnerable people and other and even with face covering. She said, well, if you want to bring a mask with you, you can bring a face covering. But she hasn't really encouraged people. And the last time I was at Hy-Vee. I would say 20 to 25% at most of the customers were wearing face masks. All of the staff were, uh, but not, not so much the customers. Some were uh, more than a month ago, but still far, far from universal. Right, right. Well, this, this actually leads really well into my next question, which is, um, you know, there's a lot of framing that's happening, um, political framing, um, one of which is when it comes to shelter in place or masks, um, like you're saying, there is a framing of, lives versus liberty mm -hmm. Can you talk to us or or lives versus the economy you know mm -hmm. and can you talk to us about what are the politics behind you know those two ideas well there are some people who are just discounting that that covid-19 is causing a lot of deaths but then for the people that like leaving those people aside right. the ones who are acknowledging that yes opening up the economy is going to lead to more people getting sick I've been shocked to see some of the commentators who basically say we should sacrifice a lot of our senior citizens to get the economy going. And many times these are people who would call themselves pro-life in, in orientation. And I was just looking today, because I check every few days, the Facebook feed of uh, State Representative Steve Holt. He's a Republican in the Iowa House. He represents the Denison area where there are major meatpacking plants. And Crawford County now is in the top five counties for COVID-19 cases per capita. It's a big hotspot. And yet he's been one of the loudest voices for opening up the economy and he's still there. He's still saying the governor is allowing us to get back to liberty and we shouldn't be flattening the economy. And it's it's really striking to me that, that there are many people who are willing to make that trade-off and, uh, and just even knowing that it's likely going to lead to more people dying. But there are people who are discounting the number of deaths that, that the coronavirus is causing as well. Right, right. Well, and we're seeing, I mean, to talk about, you know, some of the, you mentioned the meatpacking um, plants. Um, there is a, news came out about the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 is having on, um, you know, members in our minority community. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of individuals, immigrants who are working in meatpacking plants and, and such. What are you, what are the politics? I mean, there's obviously a, going back to the divide question, you know, that mm -hmm. Ira pointed out in his article, you know, there's a racial divide, there's a socioeconomic divide, there's all kinds of divides, but, um, you know, why is there a disproportionate impact on the minority communities? Well, I think the politics would be very different if COVID-19 were disproportionately hitting wealthy white people. I absolutely believe that. And when the governor not only was encouraging the meatpacking plants to stay open, but actually in one of her proclamations, made sure that local government authorities would not be able to shut down businesses they thought were a threat to public health. I, I feel that that's unconscionable. And I've been, the Iowa Department of Public Health has been publishing the racial and demographic breakdown of the cases. And I've been checking that uh, just about every day or every two or three days. And we're running at about 24% of the confirmed cases in Iowa of, of are Latinos who make up about 6% of the population. And of in the African American community, it's about 13% of the confirmed cases. And the Asian community, it's about 10%. And Asians are less than 3% of the population. African Americans are about 4% of the statewide population. And a lot of that is related to the number of immigrants from Asia or Africa or Spanish-speaking countries who work in meatpacking plants. It's a very difficult job. And 
frankly, the working conditions aren't the safest even without a pandemic. But right now, it's just a very dangerous occupation to have. And my heart goes out to the families who are having to make that choice about sending someone to work, even at the risk. There may be people in their households who have underlying conditions that put them at very high risk of severe complications or death, but they need a paycheck. So I think that's just tragic. And I've been regularly reporting on the racial disparities, and that's something that I'm going to continue to keep an eye on during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you for doing that. And, you know, everybody check out Bleeding Heartland to, you know, as those articles pop up and, you know, watch that as well. That's, yeah, thank you. Well, you know, Rob Davis has a question actually that was posed for me, but I'm going to flip that back to you. Um, he's talking about, he wants to understand why House and Senate Democrats have, um, you know, not been more, and he would say, out front on some of these policies. Um, I certainly um, have been doing the best I can to be out front on some of these um, bad policies and the ways in which, um, you know, we're inflicting harm unnecessarily when we have good evidence of other places around the country doing this better. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, can I ask you, how should the Democrats, I mean, you're a political blogger and commentator, how should the Democrats from the minority be responding in this time? What would you recommend to I'm not a mind reader, so I can't speak to what's on their minds. And, and I, I will say that I, I perceive that the Democrats have tried to be cautious and not seem to be politicizing by criticizing the governor too much. I think in March, I think that the Democrats were really waiting and hoping that the governor would do the right thing. And then finally, at the last week of March, I remember that um, House Democratic Leader Pritchard and Senate Democratic Leader Peterson, they did issue a statement calling for the governor to issue a state a stay at home order, uh, which of course she didn't do. But they, I think that there's just been a general reluctance to to be seen to be too critical of what's happening. The one state, Senator Rob Hogue of Cedar Rapids has probably been the most outspoken. I've seen him very frequently using his social media feeds to say people need to be staying home. We need to be doing more. He's been calculating almost every day the rate of increase of COVID-19 in counties all over the state. And so I think he's probably been the most aggressive. And I just, I think it's a tough balance to strike because honestly, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that that you don't wanna be accused of politicizing a healthcare crisis. But on the other hand, and I saw Representative Jacoby who represents the Coralville area and that's where the state hygienic lab is. He posted a few days ago about how the Republicans have cut the state hygienic labs funding and I looked into it and I put up a post yesterday on that at my site. It was absolutely correct. The Democrats increased funding for the lab when they control the legislature. As soon as the Republicans got back in control in the House, they tried to cut the funding. The Senate Democrats were able to get an increase, but the state hygienic lab, which is absolutely critical to yeah. our response to COVID-19, hasn't had a state appropriation increase since 2013. Yeah. I mean, that's outrageous. So that's, a, it, it, anyway, I, I think it's, it's a tough call for Democrats. And I, I probably would maybe nudge people to be a little more outspoken, but I do understand the reluctance to do that. Right, right. Well, we have, um, I'm, I'm looking at the time, we don't have too much, um, but on the area of, you know, Democrats have the opportunity in 2020, there's four seats in the Iowa House of Representatives. They have the opportunity to flip those four seats and take the majority. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's the likelihood of that happening after you've watched race after race after race? You know, what are your thoughts on that? It's really tough. I, I did a big overview of the Iowa House landscape right after the filing deadline in March. It was really one of the last big pieces I did before I started shifting all my attention to this pandemic. But there, I could definitely put together a roadmap to for There are lots of seats that Democrats could potentially pick up, lots of open seats. I mean, there are also some tough seats to defend. I think for no one knows what the turnout's going to be like. It might be an election that largely happens by mail, but the best thing Democrats can do is try to find an Iowa House or Iowa Senate candidate fairly close to their area and try to get people informed. And I mean, the Iowa House is definitely within reach for Democrats, but I think that mostly this November election is going to be a referendum on Donald Trump. And it may be challenging, especially if it's still not safe in the fall to do a lot of door to door campaigning, it may be challenging for the House candidates to get their message out. So Facebook is a good way that people can can yeah. reach voters. But I definitely would encourage Iowans to keep an eye on those state legislative races. Yeah, they are so, you know, I've only been in the legislature two years, but it's just the the harm or the good that can happen on a local level is um, significant in a state legislature. And so I know we often take, you know, put our focus on the federal level, um, you know, but what happens in our own backyard is really what most mostly impacts Iowa every, 
Iowans every single day. So very, very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Um, you know, I'm excited to be legislating in the majority. So right. <laughs> 2020, I want it to come soon. So um, I am looking at the time and I have to say, um, Laura, we have run out of time. Um, well, thank you but, so much for having me. Yeah, but people can follow you on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. They can look at Bleeding Heartland and find you there. You're on Facebook. You're everywhere. So I'll tell everybody, if you didn't get your question, you know, answered, just tune in to what Laura is doing online. Um, and oh, yeah. Send me a message through Facebook or post it on my feed and I'll, I'll try to answer it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And then for those of you who are tuning in, tuning in, I'll be back again on Monday with Representative Ross Smith and Timmy Brown Powers from Waterloo. And we're actually going to dive into the meatpacking plants um, and what's been happening in Waterloo. So those two representatives will um, be with me um, at 12 noon on Monday. So looking forward to seeing you there. And thank you again, Laura. Thank you. All right. Take care.